that. And sometimes even in the church, we fear if we work hard somehow, we're going to get God's grace. That's not what that means. It means it is God's grace combined with our obedient lives. And some people want obedient lives that don't have sacrifice or even discipline or commitment. We haven't met. My name is Mark Edworthy and Roger and I switch pulpits today and always feel compelled to just say a word of gratitude. Thank you for your investment. I saw some this morning who volunteer out at different programs at our place. If you haven't visited, come check us out. Uh, God is alive and well in uh, Missouri City. We baptized our 44th person in our 40th month. You're going to see a photo. I believe we have one of our recent uh, baptisms there in the gym where we meet. And uh, God is active, and uh, we appreciate your partnership in all this happening there. Uh, we heard illusion a while ago that we're on a new journey today as our three campus church. We're going to embark through the series called Faithful. Uh, this sub series is called In the Fire. And we're going to talk about that first half of Daniel, one of the greatest narratives in all the Old Testament. And then we're going to actually step into the fire of Revelation uh, all the way from then until Advent. So a buckle up. It's going to be an amazing journey in all of our campuses. And as always, context is key. Uh, what's happening around 600 B.C.? And that's the time that Daniel and his friend 605 are going to be deported uh, sometimes you, you separate biblical history from history, which is really not healthy. About the same time the Greeks were building the Acropolis, uh, about the same time Aesop was writing his fables that you studied in school, about the same time Confucius was out in the east, as was Buddha. And so all these things are happening when the, the empire of Babylon, the Babylonian empire, is about to reach its zenith there. And uh, these young men are going to be taken on a 900-mile journey. You can see there. Uh, think about walking from here to Orlando, all right? That's about how far those four, and probably closer to 40 or 50 young men from Jerusalem had to make that journey so many years ago. Uh, again, we love stories of refugees or immigrants that make it. And uh, again, in the Old Testament, this isn't the only story. You remember the story of Joseph. We will actually see many similarities as Joseph also is taken to a foreign country where he did not want to go. And yet he rises up there to become prime minister. Daniel and his three friends are taken to a foreign country where they don't want to go. And yet they're blessed of God as well. Uh, again, many of us probably know refugees or immigrants. I can think of a young man who went to high school with me of a Chinese background, and he and his family moved here and moved into a house with other family members, extended family, and all the kids had to work in the restaurant, and they worked hard, and they worked long, and yet through that, they began to flourish in, into the next generation. And so it's an amazing story of how God can bless when we give our hope to Him and our hands to Him as well. Again, 605 B.C., uh, I look at it this way, probably the, uh, the Babylonians went to a meeting of the Jerusalem National Honor Society, and they got the best of the best. And they had took these young people, again, we don't know their ages, probably 15, 16, and had traveled that long journey to Babylon. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Daniel in the Old Testament. If you don't, we always give the plug on our app. You can go to our electronic version and scroll down to the uh, prophecy of Daniel. And again, we'll be here for many weeks, not consecutively this morning. I won't preach that long, but we'll be in chapter one. And if you miss chapter one, you really miss the book uh, because we all know about the dreams. We know about the fiery furnace. We know about the lion's den. But if Daniel fails in chapter one, there is no fiery furnace. There is no lion's den and there is no story of faithfulness. So when you go back, how did it begin? And uh, again, I've already alluded to the deportation in verse four. They're described uh, from nobility. They're taken, they're put on a three-year program to learn the language of the Babylonians, the culture, the teaching, the science, the beliefs, all of that. They're given new names, which we'll underscore here in just a moment. And I want to pick up in verse 8 and read to the end of the chapter. So if you have your Bible, or it will be on the screen as well, we pick up that says, but Daniel, there's a contrast there, but Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food, or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. And the commander of the officials said to Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king who has appointed your food and your drink. For why should he see your faces looking more haggard than the youths 
who are your own age, then you would make me forfeit my head to the king. But Daniel said to the overseer, whom the commander of the officials had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days and let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be observed in your presence and the appearance of the youths who are eating the king's choice food and deal with your servants according to what you see. Verse 14, so he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. Well, at the end of 10 days, their appearance seemed better and they were fatter, is the word here, they were healthier than all the youths who had been eating the king's choice food. So the overseer continued to withhold their choice food and the wine they were to drink and kept giving them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. Then at the end of the days, which the king had specified for presenting them, the commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and out of them all, not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's personal service. As for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and conjurers who were in all his realm. And Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus the king. As a young man, I was a youth pastor for eight years, and every year we came back to Daniel 1. It is so foundational to understand who we are in Christ, our identity before the king of kings. And I'm not a youth pastor, but I'm going to do what a youth pastor would do. Uh, I'm going to ask all the youth to stand. Uh, You're probably still awake. So middle school, high schoolers, I want you to stand to your feet. Not to embarrass you completely, but if you'll stand and remain standing, because you may not realize you are described in the Bible. Verse 4, let's see how the description is. It talks about youth and who was no defect, who are good looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding, discerning knowledge, and who had ability for serving in the king's court. Church, can you imagine if these were taken from us? That's what happened in Jerusalem that day. Thank you guys, you can be seated. And they took the best of the best, and they made them serve at the king's court. But what I want you to hear today is those young people have a lesson for all of us today in 2024. And I don't want us to miss. There are actually three lessons I want to share in the remaining time. First, we see the rejection of labels. And our world needs to hear this probably more than any word I'll say this morning. The rejection of labels that led to the resolution of heart and then the realization of God's plan for them. Rejecting Labels. Every generation thinks it's unique. I think that's just part of the human context. And uh, sometimes we think this has never happened before. Peer pressure just came with Facebook. Uh, actually, it didn't. It, uh, it preceded Facebook. It preceded my life, my father's, my grandfather's. All the way back to that day, there was pressure to conform. In fact, back in the 1950s, there was called an experiment called the Ash Conformity experiment. Now, you you can see it on the screen, and this was done on the college campus. That uh, There was usually a test group of eight. Now, seven were in on it, and only one wasn't. And so they would put these eight in a room, and they would show signs like this, and you can see which one lines up. And the first two, everyone agreed to say, okay, what's the answer? The right answer is this one. But from three to 12, seven of them were coached to say, agree on the wrong answer, and they did. 75% of the others went along sometime during the test to agree with the majority. That's the power of conformity, that we want to fit in. And that hasn't changed. And in fact, in that day, conquered peoples were expected to serve the gods of the conquerors. I mean, the reasoning was, if if Babylon is stronger than Israel, that means Babylon's gods are stronger than Israel's god. That seems logical, does it not? Well, it's not, because... Israel's God is the creator of the universe, but that was the expectation. And so for them to arrive, what's the first thing they do? If you look in your Bible, look in verse 7. And many people miss this, and my my kids will roll their eyes every time they hear someone talk about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That was not their names. That was not their names. That was the pagans' label upon them. We don't have to accept the names the world gives us. Their names were Daniel. Mishael, Azariah, and Hananiah. That was their names. Well, you may say potato, potato. Does it really matter? Yes, it does. Let, let me explain the names 
that they were given at birth and the names they were given in the far country. Daniel, God is my judge. I have a grandson who has the name Daniel. Belteshazzar, Baal, protect me. Ananiah, God is gracious. Shadrach, the command of Aku. Aku was the moon god of the Babylonians. Mishael, who is God. Meshach, who is Aku. Azariah, God hath helped Abednego, servant of Nebo, who is a science god of the Babylonians. Don't miss this. Society can change your name, but it can't change your character. It cannot change your character unless you allow it to do so. Uh, many of you know I served on the mission field most of my adult life, and one of my good friends from a nearby country, they adopted a little boy. We adopted two kids, and as they raised that boy, he had trouble fitting in. Uh, he had different social anxieties, different uh, social awkwardness, and they moved back to the States to help him and uh, went to middle school, and, and he really just didn't fit in. He was a bit effeminate, just, just had struggles, and finally there was a group of three or four that said, what, what the issue is, is, is you're actually gay, and if you just embrace that, It'll all work out. And there was devastation in this little boy who was just confused and didn't know. But the the world was ready with the label, and he was ready for a group, no matter what it was. And uh, that's just one. It can be addiction. It can be many other things. But we need to be careful that our identity is found in Christ alone. And, and, And young people, I'm not just speaking to you. There are many here who are in their 20s. 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and no one knows when they look in the mirror, they still hear the bully from middle school. They still maybe hear their father who criticized them as a kid, and, and maybe they, they still hear those words, you're, you're clumsy, or, or you're out of shape, or, or you're, you're, you're dumb, or, and, and I, I obviously can't share other words that some may remember, and yet you've never dropped it. You've never let it go. Please hear this morning, your identity, if you're a follower of Christ, you're an adopted son or daughter of the king. You can't stop the world from labeling you, but you can stop the acceptance of it. They were never Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Others may call them that, but they said, no, we belong to the Lord. Again, years ago when I was serving with the uh, International Mission Board, I was visiting our work in Athens. We have a a refugee center there, and there are many from Iran. And if uh, you haven't heard, there are literally hundreds of thousands, over a million Iranian Christians. They're just, the Persians are just an amazingly open people group to the Lord. And I met a young man, they introduced him as Rashid. And Rashid was born Muslim in Iran, but he smiled and he shook my hand. He said, my name is John. He'd been baptized that week. And the grace of God, John. You see, he, he rejected the identity that he was given at birth, and he accepted the identity of the one who died for him. See, that is our choice. We don't have to live with the labels others give to us. And if you haven't noticed, our world is feasting on our young people. Our world is taking advantage of every avenue to convince them they're something other than they are. And young people don't accept it. Just simply say, no, that's not the identity that I choose. Uh, Across social media, just in the last few months, I've seen several times the phrase, choose your heart. You may have seen it, but uh, I think there's a great message. It says, marriage is hard, divorce is hard, choose your heart. Uh, Obesity is hard, staying fit is hard, choose your heart. Living within your means is hard, living with debt is hard, choose your heart. You're hard. Serving Jesus is hard, but the ramifications of not serving Jesus is hard. Choose your heart. It's not the choice between easy and hard. It's just choosing which path you're going to say. It was not easy for Daniel to stand up to the overseer, but he did. And he did by rejecting the label instilled upon him in a different country. Again, many of us can identify with Daniel. You may be in a place you never intended to be. Maybe it was bad choices. Maybe it was totally outside your your control. But though you may be where you don't want to be, you don't have to be who you don't want to be in that place. And you're not alone. Reject the label. Let's move on. Resolution of heart. Uh, Verse 8, New American Standard says, but Daniel made up his mind. Literally, uh, in the original, but Daniel set his heart on something. And we're going to see what that is, not to defile himself. I like the quote by Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Of two evils, choose neither. 
Now, some believe that refers to our upcoming election. That's not my, my application this morning. Is that uh, Daniel could have chosen acceptance. Okay, I'll take the, the food. Or deception. I, I won't take food, but I'll act like I take the food. But that wasn't the course that he took. Uh, again, the prayer clauses is going to be uh, presented later in the story. You remember with the lion's den encounter. But I believe it began at the beginning. And in prayer, he decided before the Lord, these are my boundaries, this, this far and, and no more. And, and don't miss this, folks, that who Daniel was, was determined in Jerusalem, not Babylon. It was determined in Jerusalem, not Babylon. What does that mean? That means you set your boundaries in your prayer closet, not in the middle of a date, not, not at a party. That, that you're attending. I used to tell young people all the time, before you leave your house, you better know this far and no more. And uh, again, as a youth pastor, I can't count how many times. Pastor Mark, I, I never intended to do that. One thing led to another. It was never my plan. I just found myself. And of course, my question, why did you find yourself? Why, why, why were you past that, that boundary, those rails that God gives us for protection, not to deny us, to free us? actually. And, and the young people, again, it's not just you. Uh, those of us in, in the business world, other things, uh, whether it's cutting corners on taxes or, or other business challenges that we have, integrity is what we decide before we leave the house, not in the boardroom when others are, are being pulled in a direction that you realize really isn't fully truthful and honest. It says in the text, he would not defile himself. Again, what are those limits that God has placed from his word into your heart? Uh, verse 9 is a beautiful passage. It says, now God granted Daniel favor. Doesn't that sound familiar? Remember Joseph over and over. But God granted Joseph favor there in Potiphar's house and then in the prison. Uh, and in verse 12, you see conviction combined with wisdom. Uh, Daniel doesn't demand his way. Uh, verse 8 says he asks permission and then he actually has a plan. Uh, you know, would you allow us for 10 days to do this? Now, now, I'll be honest, as a kid, I thought Daniel chapter one was a chapter that I had to eat my carrots. I really, that's how my parents viewed this. That, uh, you know, look at Daniel, he ate his vegetables and uh, look how strong he was. And uh, actually studying God's word, I think it's deeper than that. Now, now parents use what you need. But uh, I, I believe the, the, the point is not, that it was vegetables over meat. In fact, what was the issue? Well, there are two clear ones. One, it was not kosher. Okay, you realize that. It was not according to the Mosaic dietary laws. And anything made in a non-kosher kosher kitchen would not be kosher. But some of these would have been animals that were forbidden. And I believe even more importantly, some, if not all of this, would have been sacrificed to idols. And uh, for that reason, Daniel and his friends said, no, uh, I will not defile myself. Now, again, don't miss this. That's the part they control. Now, could they have been forced? Yes, they could have. There are some things outside of our control, but they said, basically, as long as it depends upon me, I will not defile myself. Conviction was what they stood upon. Uh, I was looking this week, it's hard to believe, almost 70 years ago. You may recognize the woman in the photo behind me. December the 1st, 1955, Rosa Parks uh, entered a bus there in Montgomery, Alabama, and she sat down in the front, and she was told to move back, and she refused. And uh, the, the Montgomery uh, Metro boycott began that week. And uh, many of you know the changes that happened. And it began with the conviction. Uh, no, my conviction is this. And uh, I, I may be called the lesser person, but I'm not going to accept a lesser label. And uh, Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Az Azariah came to the point where they said, we will not defile ourselves. So the question, what about us? Are those limits firm or are they kind of flexible? Well, if you want to go along to get along, uh, sometimes that may be wise, but in terms of conviction, it really isn't. Uh, again, these young 15-year-olds, 16-year-olds, they set an example by rejecting the labels of their day. Uh, a resolution of heart to say we will stand firm. Well, what happens? Well, we do find a realization of God's plan. Uh, if you were to summarize the book of Daniel in two words, it would be this, God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty. Well, God's sovereign 
in a, a foreign nation? Yes, he is. With foreign pagan kings? Yes, he is. God is sovereign in all things. And so later when we see the, the amazing dreams that come and go, and we see the fiery furnace, we see the lions, do, do you realize that none of that would have happened if they'd failed the test of chapter 1? You see, if they had joined the others at the table, there would be no testimony to stand up to this king and subsequent kings that are going to come. I don't know if you heard the pro progression a while ago, but, but first God listened, and then the overseer listened, and then the king listened when these four youth spoke, and even more than what they said, their lives exhibited. Uh, again, in Daniel, you see he was courteous in verse 8, asking for permission. Verse 10, he was reasonable. Please, sir, give us 10 days. And then, young people, I, I want you to hear this third one. He was hardworking. I, I think there's some that discount that. And sometimes even in the church, we fear if we work hard somehow, we're going against God's grace. That's not what that means. It means it is God's grace combined with our obedient lives. And some people want obedient lives that don't have sacrifice or even discipline or commitment. And again, verse 17, he says, as for these four youths, God gave. That's grace. But in verse 20, he says, they proved themselves 10 times greater than the others. That's work. That's investment. That's study. That's proving themselves of a rightful service servant of the Lord. And in that, God blessed them. It, it, it's both. Uh, again, I heard the story years ago about a, a farmer who bought a, a dilapidated shack in a neglected field. And he, and he worked so hard to, to rebuild the, the home. He invested in the, the field there. He tilled it and he fertilized it and he seeded it. And at, at the, the end of the harvest, there was a bumper crop. And one of his pious neighbors came by and said, wow, God has given a great crop. And he went on and on how God has blessed you. God has done this. God has done that. And finally, the guy had enough. He said, you should have seen it when God had it by himself. And, and again, I'm, I'm not sacrilegious here, but I'm saying that it's both. That, that, it, that it isn't that we sit in a dilapidated house and say, God bless the crops. Is God use me to bless the crops. And we see in Daniel both. Yes, God blessed, and he found favor, undeserved grace, and yet he worked and he applied himself along with these others. What about us? Are, are we making wise decisions? Are, are we actually applying ourselves to the directions of God's word? Uh, what if Daniel had been disqualified at that table? Then again, we wouldn't see the life that grew and the biblical principle, you know that those who are faithful in small things are often given opportunities to be faithful in bigger things. And that's how the story is going to unfold. Uh, some of you may recognize uh, the name Fred Akers. He was a coach at the University of Texas years ago, a football coach. And as almost all football coaches, he was fired uh, there from his position. And uh, at, at the press conference, uh, I came across this statement. He said, I can't always control the circumstances but I can control my response. And I thought, that's it. We can't control any of the circumstances we're placed in, whether at work or home, school, community, but we can control our response. Do we have a godly response even when there's an ungodly attack against us? As our title this morning says, unmoved. Do we take a stand to say we will stand upon a rock? That's how you're unmoved. It's not just by determination. It's by position. Are you standing on an unmoved object? Are you upon a rock that does not move? And throughout Daniel, we will see them making choice after choice after choice to say, my hope is in the Lord. My faith is in the Lord. Uh, again, an oft-repeated preacher joke in person. I don't think it's accurate, but that never keeps a preacher from sharing it. That uh, the story is a, of a U.S. battleship that uh, is on a course and actually detects directly straight ahead a, a light and then the radio man radios the, uh, the other end of the equation. And someone picks up the radio and the battleship says, uh, this is a U.S. battleship and uh, we, we command you to divert 15 degrees to the north. And the response came back, uh, the response negative, uh, you divert 15 degrees to the north. Well, the, the captain heard it and he picks up the, the, the radio and he says, this is the captain. This is a U.S. battleship. We're on our course. Uh, I command you to divert. 15 degrees to the north. And the response said negative. Uh, I would suggest you divert 15 degrees to the north. Well, he'd had enough. He says, our course has been set. We're going to continue. 
And uh, if you choose not to, you will pay the consequence. And the guy came back. He said, sir, this is a lighthouse. You choose. <laughs> and, uh, so, so unmovable doesn't mean inflexible. And it doesn't mean unwise. It means standing against the current of that day. And uh, we're not in Babylon, but in many ways we are. And uh, in some ways the challenges look different, but in some ways they don't. And our choice is, will we stand firm? I've taught preaching in several countries, and one of my rules I'm about to break, I always tell my, my students, be careful not to make yourself the hero of all your stories. And so it's with trepidation that I share one final story. I was 16 years old. I was raised not too far from here, active in our church. And young people, you won't believe this, but back in my day, we had Sunday school, we had church, we had to be back by four for youth choir, there was training union, we had a break to go eat, and then there was evening church. So this sermon's not that long. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we, we had the break between uh, training union and uh, evening service. And so eight of us jumped in two cars, we went to a pizza inn on 18th Street, and uh, pulled our money and ordered pizza, and one of the bozos in the youth group said, hey, I'm going to order a pitcher of beer, isn't that going to be really cool? And so he did, and uh, the oldest of us was probably 16, so it's not even legal. And so they bring the pitcher of beer, and six of the eight of us uh, enjoyed that. I, I, it really wasn't that big a temptation, but I said no. Well, as often happens, apparently someone from the church was in that pizza inn. And uh, my mom got a call, or back then the, it was a house phone. Again, kids that used to be connected to the wall. And uh, the, the phone rang, and my mom answered it. And it was the pastor, and it was a pretty large church. And uh, the pastor said, uh, Miss Edworthy, your son was with a group uh, that were drinking alcohol at the Pizza Inn last Sunday, and we're going to have a parents' meeting. And my mom said, Mark, come in. And so I went in to where the phone was in the hall. And she said, Pastor says that there was a group of kids drinking beer. And I said, yeah, those bozos. And I, I didn't. I ate the pizza, but I didn't drink. And she's like, I didn't think so. Okay. Well, Mark didn't drink. And the pastor knew that. He said, no, the person that saw it said, Mark and this other guy, they didn't drink, but we still want to meet with the parents. And my mom said, I, I don't think I need to be there for that, but thank you for calling. Good night. And hung off the phone. And you may think the, the great lesson there is that, quote, I stood firm. No, the great lesson was that my mom believed me. You see, because I tried, and not perfectly so, but to live a life that was trustworthy. And when we make those small, seemingly small decisions, there wasn't enough alcohol in that small glass really to do anything. I'm still wrong. I'm not trying to defend them. But the lesson is, have you set those boundaries before a holy God that says this far and no more? Because you may think it's about today, but it's not just about today. It's about tomorrow. It's about 10 years from now. It's going to be a few years before a fiery furnace and a, and a lion's den appear in the story. But the story happens because of what happened in chapter one. Are you unmoved? Again, I'm not talking about inflexible and transcendent. I'm not talking about hateful or cruel. Uh, I'm talking about one that says, I'm going to stand firmly on God's word, filled by God's spirit, walk in God's path, fulfilling God's will. That's what it means to be unmoved. May we pledge this morning to say, yes, God, I'm going to be Daniel for this generation. So help me, God.